So without any further ado, I'll just kick into um, my talk, which is all around the collision of ICS safety and security in 2021. Uh, again, I'll try and keep an eye on the Slack. Hopefully I don't get too many distracting memes there. Um, some great uh, dialogue already happening in my channel. Thanks guys. Uh, nice, nice support from the Kiwi contingent there. Uh, so I introduced myself, as I said, um, uh, currently in the role of engineer and manager cyber for an OT security team uh, based uh, in New Zealand. Uh, my background is a senior systems engineer and a control systems training. So when I first came into the company as a systems integrator, uh, I've got put on the tools, DCS, PLC programming and similar. Uh, as I kind of worked through, I uh, uh, did my safety systems uh, training and qualification. So I'm a TV certified functional safety engineer. And I'll go into a little bit more depth about that in a moment. And of course, as we kind of deploy industrial networks, ICS, of course, we want to make sure that we've got all that network connectivity. And so starting in that network space, and then obviously that network grows into security. As we move more out of that security by obscurity, we decide, hey, we need to put a bit of security into our OT networks and what we now call OT networks. Uh, I'm a member of ISA 99. As I said, I'm a SANS instructor, so I teach the ICS 515. Uh, active defense and incident response paper with SANS and of course that gives us the grid certification. As you know I'm the APAC chair for the 2021 ICS summit and uh, many of you uh, might have seen me on the last summit which was the APAC uh, ICS summit where I was the difference maker award. So a little bit of background on me there. Uh, again, as I said, I am a functional safety engineer, um, and this is my certificate here that I achieved in 2013, uh, so I've been doing that for a little while now, around the control and uh, programming and management of safety systems. And as you can see, uh, some of the things that we get into on the functional safety and design of safety instrumented systems, or SIS, is around that process safety risk and layers of protection. Again, of course, our international safety systems, uh, safety standards and regulations. We've got our safety integrity level assignment, our safety requirement specification, our safety integrity level verification. So what is, our, what is the correct cell and how do we verify that we've designed to that? Of course, that management and that design and good engineering practice. And hopefully uh, for those of you in that security space, you can already start to see some parallels between how we manage safety, how we manage security. And there's a lot of uh, commonality between those things where we can um, draw the analogy between the two around that uh, what is what is the required level, what are the requirements of our safety system or uh, and by by extension, what are the security level requirements? How do we define that? How do we document that? How do we manage that? And how does that feed into good engineering practice? So uh, that's, that's a, a, again, a bit of the background around uh, the role in my background. Um, but I just want to kind of dial back to where we've come from in industrial safety. Again, there's been this uh, change in mindset over, chain, uh, over time. We can see there what was acceptable in manufacturing uh, 100, 200 years ago and similar, that's changed. What we considered okay and safety is no longer okay. We've grown in, that, um, in our maturity around that. We've reduced our acceptability and, and we've um, refined our tolerable risk over time all the way through from kind of 1802 is probably when the first uh, kind of movement came towards getting out of these unsafe work situations all the way to 2021. And again, we've come th uh, through kind of this passage of compliance driven, again, coming through this kind of token effort mindset. Uh, again, I, I think a lot of people, uh, depending your results may vary, uh, that we still kind of point the finger at our health and safety department. And we say that those people are responsible for safety. And again, kind of the mo more modern, higher maturity uh, organizations are doing a bit more of that safety by design and everyone is responsible for themselves, safety of themselves and others. And, and how does that kind of translate into um, a, a collision between our safety and security? Uh, well, I've got a few different case studies. Again, uh, some of these uh, pulled from our material in the ICS 515, um, and you may or may not be familiar with some of these case studies. But starting with 2014, the German steel mill, um, the uh, German government came out with their annual report in December 2014, and they said, uh, we've, we've pat ourselves on the back, we've done some good things around cyber, and by the way, there was a 
cyber attack that caused massive damage in a steelworks facility. And it was just almost a throwaway statement at the, at the bottom of the report, uh, a German, uh, in, in German report. So uh, certainly you need some translation if you want to go back and look at that source material. Um, but they uh, alluded to that detailed technical knowledge. They alluded to that uh, an incident where the furnace could not be shut down in the regular way. And I know um, uh, many of the people on the call will be familiar with the uh, steel environment and uh, the, the processes that go into that and the incredible um, safety risk that that can, um, that can present. And uh, again, where we see this impact from uh, cyber security and across the network perspective, this was actually the first time, uh, sorry, the second time we would seen damage in an industrial facility. Again, uh, obviously 2011 Stuxnet um, will be the first publicly known, but uh, certainly the, this will be the second publicly known incident where that cyber impact uh, had a catastrophic physical destruction. Uh, and so again, this, this OT cyber physical thing we really saw that colliding in, in, a, in an unsafe way. Uh, thankfully, no one was hurt in that example, um, but it was uh, it highlights again how these two things can collide. Of course, 2015 uh, is a Ukraine scenario there, and again, many of you will be familiar with uh, a Ukraine one, as we call it, in December of 2015. Our remote adversaries there using remote desktop assistant uh, doing a SCADA hijack there. Uh, three different Oblenego, so three different separate organizations, but 60 substations uh, disconnected in the middle of a Ukrainian winter. 225 customers. Now that's not 20, 225 individuals, that's 225 houses, or uh, one customer might be a hospital, and uh, some incredible impact there uh, in the midst of the Ukrainian winter obviously has that massive potential for our safety and uh, reliability, not only for uh, those um, those technicians who now have to go into that manual operation. And of course, we know that a lot of the automation that we've driven in electrical has been around getting those people out of unsafe situations, improving our resilience, improving our reliance and our reliability of our electrical infrastructure, but also making sure that we put those people in less harm. And so automatic switching from the control center and similar, of course, our, uh, our different technologies that enable that. Um, so uh, again, that impact not only for the uh, safety and the public, but also safety for those staff that are now responsible for power and delivering power for manual operation over six months. Of course, uh, four years now since we've seen uh, Triton or Trisis in Saudi Arabia. This was at a petrochemical plant, and it was the first known malware that was designed for safety systems. So the adversaries in this case uh, attempted to prevent safe operation of our safety instrumented system. And again, that safety system, uh, there's only one purpose to have really a safety instrumented system on a plant. Usually we have like our control system that keeps everything running and uh, uh, produces widgets or brings out oil and gas or delivers electricity into the grid and similar uh, as, as our control system. Our safety system is that layer on top. And again, we talked about that layer of protection that comes into the functional safety where if things get out of control, if our control system is no longer operating as design, this is where our safety system kicks in and it shuts everything down. And the purpose of that is to make sure that our safety system uh, operates and prevents kind of these big uh, scenarios, these uh, hopefully low, like, uh, low likelihood, high consequence situations. And so we can uh, kind of infer there around the adversaries where they were targeting and were able to successfully compromise in a segmented network, the safety instrument and system that was uh, only there to reduce risk, we can link that adversary intent to do harm. And again, that actor that was responsible for that uh, is still very much active in the in the space at the moment. Uh, I think we won't we we certainly haven't seen the last of them uh, in private uh, and behind closed doors. Again, a lot of those uh, events that we don't really like to talk about, um, but we uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll see them hitting the front page as well in the future. Uh, and again, most recently, uh, this, is, this has been a really interesting one. Uh, a month ago today, there was that malicious increase in dosing by a remote adversary for our uh, Florida um, water utility there. Uh, again, uh, fantastic for the organization to come out and talk about it. 
Uh, again, uh, great on that control room operator to take action, to notice, uh, to um, kind of prevent that, uh, that end effect uh, from actually having uh, um, delivering unsafe drinking water into the general public. Um, but just a few examples there where, again, everything that we do in OT security and industrial security is the cyber physical interface by default. And even if we get into this IIoT discussion, we're always uh, looking at how we interface with that physical environment. So the decisions that are being made, the controls that are taking place, whether those are automated or manual, uh, they, they have that potential for an impact on our safety and the safe and reliable operation. So how does that translate into that individual mindset of maturity? And I picked, the, picked this up off Centus as we kind of drill down from kind of a, a broadly industrial to different industries and different examples. How do we deal, drill down to the individual? And uh, I really like this maturity model because it does kind of highlight, especially as uh, we look at individuals and as individuals make up that organization, that whole uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, um, what are those cultures out there? What are those individuals out there? And what do they think about safety? Um, and all the way at this end, counterproductivity, where the company doesn't really care much about my safety, and I don't really care much, that kind of ignorance is bliss, and that apathy around safety. Again, we kind of move up our maturity model as we look at um, kind of a compliance based, uh, but only when the boss is watching. So if the boss is watching, I'll follow the rules. When he's not there, I'll just kind of do my own thing. And it just kind of gets in the way. We've, we've moved there into, okay, well, even when the boss is not watching, uh, we've still got that compliance and it's uh, still that kind of token effort, ticking the box. How do I make sure that I do the bare minimum around safety? Uh, we don't really see the value in safety, but we're working up, up the maturity model, thankfully. Um, but how can, we, how can we do better around that safety? Of course, mateship and uh, when you're getting into that space, where uh, again, we've got to have that cooperation with teammates and things to achieve good safety and all the way up to citizenship where you have that belief and uh, you really want to make sure that you look after not only yourself, your teammates, the rest of the workforce. And of course, many of us in that industrial sector, we've got that interface with uh, public, the members of the public, again, whether that's outside the fence or whether we're delivering into that environment, how can we kind of contribute positively into uh, creating a safe environment for everybody? I, th I think all organizations, this is a work in progress. I don't think anyone's really solved this safety maturity thing, but we're certainly a lot further on um, around this culture and how that's developing and how we think about safety culture and how we think about that and as industrial organizations. I'm sure almost every single one of your industrial organizations throughout APAC have this induction policy, have this, this is how we do uh, safe and reliable operations in this plant. Here's your induction, here's your PPE, here's the controls. We make sure that we eliminate, isolate and minimize and similar. So we've come a long way in safety um, but it is, it is kind of a bit of a mindset thing where we come from. We still, I think, uh, find pockets of this kind of ignorance is bliss and this apathy towards safety. Again, they'd rather just get on and do the job. Uh, it's going to take a little bit longer to go through a permit process or to put on the correct PPE or make sure that we've got all the right scaffolding and height and fall protection in place. Um, so yeah, that's moving, moving up towards, okay, well, I know I need to do this. Otherwise I'll get in trouble having that compliance focused and like a surface token effort and similar. Uh, of course, um, this is, this has been a really interesting, um, thing, uh, especially in New Zealand health and safety at work act and how, um, work safe and the government has been driving more towards empowering the workforce where you do have this differing mindset between our leadership and our workforce. So maybe the workforce uh, are really concerned about their safety, but the leadership really hasn't bought into it and don't see the value in it. And, and so you get this dig disorganized organization uh, where the, it's, it's, it can be a real challenge pushing things uphill uh, to get some buy-in, to get some investment and in safety. Um, and again, we see really massive incidents uh, around the world where that happens where uh, again, maybe there's that compliance focused or there isn't that support from the business. Uh, conversely, you can also have that leadership 
where right from the top, the C-suite, the, um, the general manager, the, the managing director and similar, really believe in safety, but they've really struggled with that workforce. That workforce mindset is a, is a far lower maturity around safety and they don't really care. And uh, again, that's that strategy from the business eats that culture for breakfast. So how do, we, how do we get that safety culture really happening so that we can have alignment between across our organization? And again, I spoke about this before, where we kind of point that finger, where, where you want to know about health and safety, you kind of go, okay, we'll go talk in that health and safety advisor. Those guys are responsible for safety. Um, again, we still see this a little bit, uh, again, less in New Zealand, but I'm sure globally, there's a lot of different places where um, you can point the finger at the health and safety department and almost uh, try and offload your responsibilities and your accountability for safety to somebody else. That's somebody else's problem and that's somebody else's responsibility. But as we do kind of grow in that safety awareness and we do have kind of that reduced safety apathy, um, again, we, we see more caring about safety and again, more drive towards that um, positive attitude to safety. We do have that reduced tolerance of our safety risk. So as we understand the safety and the requirements for safety in our environment, uh, we, we now say, okay, well, last year our risk tolerance was this, and 10 years ago in the building industry and, and, and 50 years ago, we, were, we accepted this risk in our, in our safety as we're building something or as we're making widgets or as we're producing electricity. But today we, do, we have a different tolerance level around our safety risk and our acceptability of safety risk is far lower. I remember when I did my certified functional safety engineer certification um, and the training around that, um, that the presenter gave a, a, a really good analogy around how what the general expectation is for safety at work. And uh, it really boils down to that you should be at least as safe, if not safer, at work than you are at home. Again, there's um, this, this goal zero thing. I really, I really like the ambition to try and uh, eliminate all health and safety incidents uh, across industry. Uh, but again, as long as we're doing better at work than, than uh, people would be at home, I think that's a, that's a really good target. And again, having that maturity to do that. Again, where we get into higher maturity around safety and those organizations that seem to have really been on that journey and are really moving that dial into that three, four, five out of five, we can see there that our safety department are responsible for facilitating safety. So it's no longer their problem. They're actually working and supporting the organization and all the individuals. And we get this uh, great thing with that safety as an enabler and achieving some wonderful things across safety. And we get to the point where we don't have, this is what we do and this is safety. We have, this is what we do safely as uh, I'm just trying to work around my mic and my video there, but we don't separate the safety from what we do. It's just, this is what we do safely. This is what we've built into our design. And um, again, it's that safety by design, of course. So how do we, how does that kind of boil down in terms of our ICS safety? Again, we want that robust, comprehensive, resilient design. And specifically when we get into our industrial control system side, we've got some nice standards to fall back on. And again, this forms part of that good engineering practice, that expectation for safety by design. Uh, 61508 is a, is a standard that again forms, forms core of the work that we do and, and the other part of the business around programming and designing and configuring safety systems and safety instrumented systems. Um, 61508 kind of leads into 61511 was that functional safety of the safety instrument system and you might not be able to see here on the slides but this is straight out of our, um, our standard here which looks at again starting off on that risk-based approach um, for safety again allocating that safety functions where do we need to have safety in place what are our requirements? How do we design that? And again, how do we build that? How do we commission that? And of course, you can see there that we've got um, uh, some other pillars uh, involved there, which I'll touch on in a minute. But 61511 is a guiding document for what we do in our process industry. Of course, we've, um, in our business, we've also got machine safety in New Zealand, no nuclear, I'm afraid, but uh, certainly around the world, uh, APAC and, and of course around the world, uh, a lot of nuclear. And again, all of that based on a very similar process of going through risk-based approach, what sort of safety requirements do we need? How do we design? How do we operate and maintain? Again, that decommissioning and that management side um, around there. 
And so um, we've got some tools for that. Uh, you might have heard of these again in our functional safety side, our process has analysis and our HAZOP process around that identification evaluation. Again, looking at those actions and uh, looking to address and that revalidation, making sure we close the loop to say, did we actually address the hazard? Have we actually brought that risk from our intolerable into our tolerable region. Of course, our HAZOP is one of the tools that we use for our risk analysis, and of course, our bow tie, which I'll come back to. So a little bit deeper into our 61511 as we look at this collision between ICS safety and security. In 2016, I remember presenting, presenting about this kind of five years ago. So uh, it's been there for a while where there is this requirement for a security risk assessment to be carried out to identify the security vulnerabilities of the SIS. And that's not just application vulnerabilities or network vulnerabilities, how is the system vulnerable? So how are we looking there? Again, like if we look at our 62443, our zone and conduit, if we've got an SIS zone, how is that SIS zone vulnerable? How is the conduit in and out of that SIS zone vulnerable? And again, tying back to our crisis example, we had a highly segmented environment which obviously was vulnerable because it was compromised by an adversary. And I think, again, that maturity, Sarah's gonna to touch on this, um, uh, I think a little bit later, around uh, you shall deploy to a safe environment, uh, deploy to a secure environment, um, and uh, some challenges around that. And, and we know um, when we've been doing this a while, but there's no such thing as a secure environment and bug-free code and vulnerability-free um, applications. So how do we assess that? How do we manage that? How do we identify that? How do we identify threats that can exploit those vulnerabilities and how the system is vulnerable? How do we determine those consequences? Again, a great talk from Andy and Jeff yesterday on uh, the CCE process, which has been fantastic, the CCS book on CCE, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. About what are those, what are those, how do we tie that into our consequence so that we're not just looking at likelihood, we're looking at consequence so that we better understand our risk. Of course, we need to make sure that we have those considerations for all phases and not just that operator maintain and that day to day and lifetime of the plant, but how in the design phase could this be compromised? What about the implementation? Uh, again, come, coming back to our solar ones, that build process for software that was where that was compromised, right? But before it was getting into operator maintain, that supply chain risk, again, which Sarah's gonna talk about in there. So how do we look at look after the security and the safety of the system all the way through to the design process? Um, and of course, our risk reduction, uh, and it specifically calls out in there a couple of standards. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the 27K, uh, 624421, which is looking again at our system security. Um, you might not be familiar with this other one, which is our technical report 840009. So we've got this one here, which aligns. So there's our 61511 and, and our 84009, you can see all those bold boxes where they've given specific cybersecurity guidance at each phase. What's the zoning requirements? What are the uh, cybersecurity requirements? What about FAT, SAT? Some great talks yesterday around that and how can we integrate and have our security by design for our safety system? This is where this collision comes into play. So how can we do that? Um, and again, kind of reinforce this great collision process. Of course, our PHA process that I talked about before, we've got a security PHA and our security PHA review or SPR. Uh, this is a fantastic book. Again, really driving that consequence-based cybersecurity. How can it go wrong? How can it impact not only people in the workforce, equipment, but also a member of the public. And it's got some great uh, ideas and some great things that you can do to drive that um, uh, study process. Again, talking about non-hackable safeguards. How can we ensure that by non-cyber means that we're protecting you know, safe and reliable operations or at least uh, protecting our consequence so that if we do have an impact, how can we um, mitigate that so that we don't end up having that consequence? And I'll use the bow tie to talk about that. Uh, CCE I've talked about um, before. Again, uh, this has been a fantastic effort out of Idaho National Labs. Uh, they've run a good couple of dozen of these and a lot of um, uh, grassroots organizations are kind of doing their own CCE function around that consequence-driven cyber-informed engineering. How can we design the system so that 
again, on a consequence-based, on a risk-based approach, that we're really considering how we can minimize the impact to our organization, minimize the risk, again, looking at those high consequence events, but also looking at minimizing not only the impact and the consequence, but also the likelihood of those high consequence events. Uh, fantastic. And Andy had a talk yesterday on this, so make sure you uh, check that out. Uh, actually, this morning, but it, um, it's, it was the fourth uh, yesterday, but it's the fifth today. But we're, I think, as the guys were saying, we're living in the future year. Uh, so welcome to all those Americans that have joined us on the 5th. Of course, our bow tie process, we've seen some fantastic use of this in cyber. This is already a great tool that's being used throughout uh, the functional safety side around that risk management process. So uh, again, a lot of organizations have adopted this for overall risk management. And so we were looking at process safety risk. We were looking at the catastrophic risk to the plant. And it's a fantastic tool that we can use uh, in our risk management process. And we do have all these causes that come in on the left here. Again, we've got preventative controls. And then we could have that hazard as a top event. Uh, recovery on the right-hand side, again, some other controls to mitigate, or again, eliminate, minimize, or isolate those consequences from actually uh, having that disastrous effect. And again, you can look at the efficacy and the control's effectiveness to ensure. And one of those examples is uh, maybe kind of a, a level control scenario. Again, process control, uh, filling up of an of a oil and gas tank with condensate. We've got some controls in place, uh, like our DCS, our control system, that is ensuring that the, the level stays at a, at, a, at a normal operating level. We might have some alarms on that. So if it goes higher than the expected level, if it gets up to the kind of 90s, maybe we send an alarm to the control room operator and they can take some action either through the control system or send out an outside operator. But of course, if our preventative controls fail, we might have that top event, that hazard of an overflow of a, of a tank and again, that spill situation and loss of primary containment. So we can actually have some mitigated controls there where maybe there's a bund. So even if the tank overflows, we're not gonna spill into drainways, impact the general public. We've got that secondary containment, which has stopped that potential outcome and our consequence. And again, I'm hoping that you can see these parallels in between and in, into our cyber kind of starting to flow through where we have those identify, identification and protective controls coming back to our NIST on our left-hand side. And of course, our detect, respond and recover on our right-hand side. And we can kind of feed those in as we build this model on how we manage our cybersecurity and our safety in, in, a, in, a, very, in a very cohesive way. So um, what, what do I think you should do? I think here's the, here's the key takeaways that I really want you to take away from this. Again, engage with that functional safety. Uh, we were delivering that cybersecurity or um, safety. We wanna make sure that we're having those conversations from security into safety. How can we use those safety tools like Bowtie and similar to manage that security risk? How can we handle risk appropriately at, at that technical level and have that engagement? How could the safety thing happen by a cyber means? So getting those in there. Of course, we also wanna integrate that safety into our security. How do we prioritize our security improvements and our safety critical systems and similar so that we're achieving, um, uh, again, our, our return on investment and we're prioritizing our crown jewels from a business perspective, not only for business critical, but safety critical environments and similar. Uh, again, we want to align those safety and security mindsets and philosophies. And so I'll come back to that initial slide where I kind of walk through where we've come through on safety. So how can we advance maturity and understanding, especially at that technical level where our safety people, they understand that we need safety by design. We don't need, we don't want, this is what we do. And safety, we want, this is what we do safety. Actually, we can do the same thing for security. It's not, this is what we do in security. It's, this is what we do security. And most organizations have more maturity in that safety side than the security side. How can we engage in our technical um, kind of peers and that space and achieve some wonderful things together and delivering safety and security, safe and reliable operations um, uh, in a very secure way. Of course, we certainly want to engage 
on those safety with a non-technical and that management level. Again, bringing that leadership on a journey, having safety and security on those board agendas is super important. And again, using those analogies because most boards, executive leadership team, whatever you've got in your business, whoever you're engaging with at that top level will already have some sort of mindset around safety and hopefully a positive one, a higher maturity one. Again, most organizations have a lower maturity, especially around industrial security. A lot of them have kind of already bought into the industrial safety side, but not so much in the industrial security side. So how can we um, translate that in? How can we achieve that across the, uh, across the board and understanding there? Uh, again, um, using those analogies to drive more maturity and security. Um, uh, again, for all, we want to align those that risk management process. Again, using those those risks, engaging with those risks of risk officer, um, security compliance officers, and similar. You want to make sure that you've got that prioritisation. Um, those security risks don't exist in isolation, and again, can actually be a catalyst for other safety risks and other business risks. So quite often we see with risk registers, we'll have the cyber security section, which kind of exists on its own, but actually how do we tie that and uh, understand the business continuity side and how security can feed into that, unlike other things. Um, and of course, uh, owning risk that is not yours to own. Again, we see that quite a lot, especially at that technical level and this industrial OT security thing, as people are getting more and more understanding of risks in the environment, they might just think, hey, we're not actually, um, uh, our business doesn't really care about this. We'll just kind of uh, know that they're not gonna, they're, they're gonna ignore obsolescence risk. They're gonna ignore security risks. They're gonna ignore these kind of things. And so that risk acceptance happens far lower in the org chair that I'd ever like to see. Let's make sure that we kind of escalate that up and then allow those risk owners to assess, uh, um, assess those and measure those across the business so that the risk is, um, uh, is handled appropriately. Um, using those objective measures, of course. Again, um, this is where we come in to, um, especially security professionals, safety professionals, we always think and we always understand these risks so much uh, or as much as we can and far better than the rest of uh, our peers and the organizations. Um, and we really wanna have that low risk tolerance. We really wanna drive our risk down towards zero, understanding that we're never gonna get there, but we wanna put in bit more controls and we wanna put in better security. I, uh, again, uh, I caution you in that approach. Your risks may not be the highest risks in the company. Again, your board is always going to be more risk tolerant. That is their job to accept risk on behalf of the organization. We'd be really safe if we never got out of bed in the morning, we never jumped in our car and went to work. Same thing for security. If um, uh, again, the security by obscurity um, type of approach, um, it's, it's not the best approach. It does have some, but uh, increasing our understanding and awareness of the risk is really important, but also knowing when to stop, knowing when we've actually uh, maybe having a compromising effect on our uh, safe, uh, safety via security. We're talking about pen testing during the day uh, for the um, uh, America's Day. And again, uh, more industrial networks have been taken out by uh, IT, corporate IT, pen testers and security and patching process than adversaries. Um, again, that inadvertent failure. Let's make sure that we're really careful and cautious as we bring kind of some of these IT controls. Again, our active scanning and similar. What's the best need for the environment? How do we balance up that safe and reliable operations with our security requirements so that we're adding the right amount of security? Not all the security, not no security, the right amount, again, in that risk-based approach. So that was, again, setting that security dial too high and knowing when to stop uh, is, is a challenging thing there. So again, kind of coming back to Oldsmar, uh, we haven't seen um, details uh, generally about that incident, uh, but water generally has multiple safeguards. It's a very slow moving process. Again, that ability and that capability to respond 
uh, is uh, is pretty good. Of course, our incident should have not not have happened. Of course, multiple controls failed for our adversary having remote access by the team viewer. But we did see that top event of the increase in dosing. We didn't see that consequence of delivery of unsafe walking, drinking water to the public. And again, adversary intent is always going to be a tricky one. Uh, the fact that they dialed in during the day and it was observed by that control room operator again uh, gives you a little bit of pause around what was that adversary actually trying to do um, in their in their activities. But regardless, uh, over 12, 12, 24, 48 hours, uh, there were a number of kind of, again, uh, less cyber safeguards. Um, and so we actually didn't see that uh, end consequence to the Oldsmar people. Let's make sure that we do up our game so that we can actually prevent. Uh, uh, but we do need to make sure that we've got those detective things in place and respond in recovery, of course. Uh, quick shout out to uh, Dale and Sarah and Jake and co around PLC secure coding practices. Again, I'm sure that Oldsmar and many of your organizations would um, uh, benefit from, um, again, that adversary should not have been able to dial up to 11,000 on the dosing level through the HMI. Um, that's, that's never a dosing requirement. Uh, so designing that into code, uh, especially as a controls engineer, I really love that. So just uh, my last slide here around that security and maturity mindset, and I touched on safety, but we can see the security by obscurity, this nobody cares, the security apathy, our compliance focused uh, to approach to security, a disorganized organization, maybe our workforce don't care about security, but our leadership do or vice versa. Again, maybe we still point to the security department and say that they're responsible for security. Maybe you're the security department and you always have the finger pointed at you um, where, where you're asked to deliver security and you're fully responsible, but maybe you're not enabled. So growing that security awareness into your business, into your end users, into your clients, into uh, our workforce. Again, that reduced tolerance and better understanding around security risks. Again, that security department responsible for facilitating security. And of course, our security as a business enabler, again, aligned to our business drivers. So we certainly wanna make sure that we do that. So that's that's what I've got for you. Um, I'll just jump over to Q&A. And I see uh, Riyad Aman, uh, is there any framework guidance to ensure risks OT uh, are made prioritize appropriately? Again, Riyad, um, I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to jump into the, some of those standards that I've highlighted, especially when we're looking at functional safety systems. But of course, our 61511, probably um, uh, uh, with all the biases in the world as an ISA 99 member, that, um, sorry, six, uh, 6443, I apologize. 6443 uh, is, is a good guidance. Of course, our NIST CSF, um, again, uh, the CIS, uh, CSC have got some specific OT guidance. Um, whenever I look at frameworks and guidelines, I think um, I come back to kind of Rob's closing comments today. It's about picking something and taking those steps forward. We're not going to boil the ocean. We're not going to achieve everything. Um, let's make a start. Use whatever works in your business. We've got this New Zealand standard that we use for many of our companies in New Zealand, but there's also a global standard for our global clients. Um, picking something and making a start will at least get your, your first steps into that. So yeah. that about wraps it up.